Spectrum wants to hear your views. You can SMS at any time during the show. Type Spectrum, leave a space, type in your contribution and name, then send it to 7197. Your views, our interviews on Spectrum, Radio 1 FM 90. Hello, a very warm welcome. This is Spectrum on Radio 1. I'm your host, Edmond Chizito. On Spectrum tonight, how can Uganda improve its competitiveness to attract investments? Like many other lowly developed countries, Uganda continues to struggle to overcome challenges that still block its transformation to a first-class economy and also compete with other countries for investors. Development experts note that despite having a comparative advantage in many aspects, Uganda still faces challenges that frustrate investors or those wishing to start businesses. This has led to the country being outcompeted by other countries and thus the levels of foreign direct investments do not match what is anticipated. The World Bank has conducted several studies and revealed that challenges such as corruption, poor infrastructure, lack of skilled labor and a poor business mentality to be among the top challenges in Uganda. President Museveni has repeatedly warned uh, all those frustrating investors by asking for bribes. But there are concerns about the quality of investors the government has cleared and the tax holidays involved. The world has become very competitive and it is incumbent upon each country to lay strategies to overcome challenges that keep coming on. So tonight we'll look at the latest efforts being made as we also look for lessons elsewhere to plan better for the country. Our guests tonight... Professor Ricardo Hosman from the Harvard University is director of the Center for International uh, Center for International Development at Harvard University. You're most welcome, Dr. Professor Ricardo. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. We're also joined by Dr. Peter Ngategiz, the National Coordinator of the Competitiveness and Investment Secretariat at the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. You're most welcome, Dr. Ngategiz. Thank you very much. Good evening, listeners. We're also joined by Mr. Moses Ogual Goli. Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Private Sector Foundation. You must welcome Mr. Mazusugwa. Thank you very much and uh, good evening, listeners. Well, maybe perhaps uh, to open this up, let's get to know a little bit about our guests. Uh, professor Ricardo Hosman, Director and Professor of the Practice of Economic Development from Harvard University, is a former minister in the government of Venezuela. He's a former minister for planning in the government of Venezuela. He's a former member of the board at the Central Bank in Venezuela, former chief economist at the Inter-American Development Bank. <coughs> He has advised 80 developing countries worldwide on creativity, effective growth strategies, and development policies. Now, Dr. Peter Ngategize has a PhD in agricultural economics from Michigan State University in the USA. He served in various academic policy and management positions, both within and outside of Uganda. And since May 2003, he has served as the national coordinator for the competitiveness and investment climate strategy in the Ministry of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development. He's a member of the board of directors of Centenary Bank and chairman of the Appointments Committee in Kavali University. Mr. Moses Ogwal is uh, at the Private Sector Foundation, as mentioned earlier. He's a formerly, he formerly worked at the East African Business uh, Council in Arusha and uh, at the Ex Uganda Export Promotions Board. Also, he was also CEO of the Fish Sector. Dr. Ngategize, why is Professor Ricardo Hosman here in the country? Thank you, uh, Edmund. I think you have already said it off. All. Uh, Professor Ricardo's profile speak for itself and as you have just said in your introduction Uganda couldn't have needed him uh, more than today his experience uh, in advising developing countries as a professor uh, as you have said uh, of uh, development economics but also uh, the research work he's got into partnership with Economic Policy Research Center in Uganda and an ongoing training that should culminate into uh, some results that we hope can guide uh, Uganda on how to accelerate uh, structural transformation in Uganda is the reason why we are honored to have had uh, the professor start engaging with uh, the government of Uganda. All right, and he'll be talking to, he'll be issuing a talk tomorrow. Could you, would you like to talk to us about that briefly? Oh, yes. Um, tomorrow we will once again be hosting our uh, sixth national competitiveness forum. 
we have gone through six fora uh, over the last uh, six years. Uh, you may recall, Edmund, that last uh, year, November 3rd, we had the President launch our competitiveness and investment climate strategy. And this year, we basically will be focusing on youth in innovation and entrepreneurship for structural transformation. And I think the title says it all. You know how important the youth are, and yet vulnerable in the face of um, growing challenges for employment and prosperity. All right. Professor Hosman, what exactly is this concept of competitiveness? Well, um, the, um, the concept of competitiveness is, is it tries to capture the ability of a country to um, produce things at, uh, uh, with greater productivity. And it's an indirect measure of how productive can a country be in, in the set of activities it engages in. Uh, I think that um, development is really not about uh, making more, more of the same things more productively. Development is really about changing the things you make, make more things, be more diverse, and among the things you make, make more complex things, things that are harder to make. So countries go from making few things that are relatively th simple to making many things that are more difficult to make. And that is really uh, the process of development. Countries grow by doing that. And in plain, simple terms, how does it help a country to grow? Take you to step, one step further first. Well, uh, you're right. Growth is really like more like uh, it, it's, it, it, it's in time what happens. What you want really is people to have higher incomes. Right? And people, if there's poverty, if there's low income in society, you want to go from low income to high income. So you have to grow your income. That's growth. So growth is the growth of income. And the only way a poor country can become rich is by growing its income. So the only way a poor country can become rich is through growth. Growth full of people. Because our nation could be rich, but its people might not have the money. Libya has a lot of money. It not necessarily goes to the people's pockets. Right. If you have, a, if, if you have something like oil, <coughs> If, if you have something like oil, you can um, uh, um, get a lot of money out of the oil. But most countries become rich because people are willing to work. And people are willing to work everywhere in all countries. But um, what makes it... Um, uh, uh, w what lacks in Uganda is not people's willingness to work. That has always been there. What is lacks in Uganda is people's opportunity to have work done highly productive so that a lot of things are produced with their effort. So really the strategy of development is a strategy of finding opportunities for people to be very productive at work. So let's bring it down here. Yeah, how, how do you move from where we are at now, applying your, theor your theories? And I notice you're not a theoretical uh, you know, person. You talk about uh, practical. Well, how do you bring it down here? Well, uh, you, have to, you have to go, f you have to add to the things you're currently doing, you have to add more things. Uh, and in the process of adding more things, you have to create the capabilities that will allow you to add those things to the things you're, you're producing. For example, if you think about it, you think of yourself as a, as a country that is landlocked, far away from the coast. But you're only about a thousand kilometers from Mombasa. Well, you know, Johannesburg is 900 kilometers from Cape Town. And you have a, a big uh, automotive industry in Johannesburg, and they bring their stuff from the port of Cape Town. So it's not that because you are so far from the coast, there aren't many things you could do by importing raw, ma importing raw materials and pieces and transforming them here. It's impossible now because the roads are a disaster, because electricity is bad, because maybe the labor training of people is, is still not there. And so these activities don't currently exist. Well, typically countries don't have uh, the capabilities, the infrastructure, and the know-how for the things that they don't do. So the question is, how do you uh, solve this chicken and egg problem of, of doing new things and providing the things that those new things need? And what I've tried to do is I've tried to map out sort of like what are the kinds of things uh, that you could be doing next. 
For example, you have a strong base in agriculture. Well, there's a lot of food processing that can be going on. But food processing requires manufacturing facilities, and manufacturing facilities need a lot of stuff to be there. Manufacturing facilities need power, need water, need logistics, need workers to be able to go in and out, need security, need the labor training of certain skills. So, for example, the Chinese have mastered this way of encouraging manufacturing by creating industrial zones, places where all the requisite infrastructure is there. And it has to be coupled with a certain kind of urban development so that workers don't have to travel ridiculous distances and so that there is a, a mechanism for them to get to work. Uh, and if you're going to do that to scale, you cannot do that with the current infrastructure in Uganda because the power is not there, the road system is not there, the urban transport system is not there to support uh, efficient uh, industrialization at a different scale. Well, if I learned it very, very clear, but not before we move forward, you have been looking at some of your concepts, see, and I emphasize your director and professor, the practice of economic development, not the theory, the practice of economic development. You've outlined um, some, you say, you know, you, if you look at a product and you talk about improving products and moving from what you have to what you do not have by adding value and moving one step at a time, you talk about a product as a tree and a set of products as a forest. Would you like to explain that theory to us? So, so this is the way I, I think of the world. I think uh, of, of, um, uh, of each product being like a tree and the set of all possible products being like a forest and countries being a collection of companies, firms, entrepreneurs, they are like monkeys that populate certain trees, that is, they make certain products. And the process of development involves the monkeys taking over the forest. And the monkeys take over the forest by jumping from the trees they're in to trees that are relatively nearby because monkeys don't have wings. They don't jump long distances. They have to move from the things they know how to do to things that could they could figure out how to do more or less with transformations of the know-how they already have. In, and and uh, that's, that's the way development happens. So development is really about expanding the set of uh, productive possibilities in your economy by encouraging uh, not only an improvement of the things you're already doing, but by adding new things, and by adding new things that leverage what you already know, but that add knowledge you don't have. Dr. Ngatigza, what kind of lessons do we immediately pick from this? If we're planning for the next 40 years, what would we begin to look at? He's spoken about agricultural processing adding value. What kind of things would we begin to look at? I think uh, I'm not familiar with much of his work. I'm still learning. But I think from what has just presented, he's basically saying, doing better what you're already doing, but also leveraging those things that you are doing to move to new areas of what you are doing. So take an example, if we all know how to produce coffee, then we should possibly move this forward into trying to improve the quality of that coffee that we produce, but possibly add value. And I think adding value may not necessarily be producing Nescafe, but might be improving the grades, the standards, and opening up into market opportunities that you have around. So in simple terms, that's what I'm seeing, and I think that's the kind of direction that we have been working along. But he's also speaking, talking about not just producing more of what you're really producing, but adding to what you're producing without jumping, but moving maybe from coffee to something closer to coffee with a higher level of value. Are there are logical things that we could pick up from coffee? We've been growing coffee since the 1920s. 20s. What kind of crops would we be looking at moving to, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. So if you keep into the coffee situation, uh, and you know Uganda is basically one of the global coffee producers, uh, not only do we have of significant volumes, but also the quality that we get onto the global market is important. But I believe that um, within around coffee alone, and some of the initiatives we have had, you are aware of Kaweri Coffee in, uh, in, uh, in the Mugende region, uh, it becomes about you know taking a advantage of say economies of scale, and then again going to farmers and reducing the value chain so that uh, you are able to increase the returns to the farmer 
improve the productivity but also the quality and value of the export that you are taking outside that. And I think the idea then is that if you appreciate that and you can see how to improve uh, the value and manage the, the value chain across into the global market, then some of the other products that we have, say take an example maize, uh, we still have challenge in maize in terms of being able to actually export uh, even to Kenya in our neighbors. So we need to be clear about the standards that are being that are required and the infrastructure needed uh, to get this maize out of the field before the next rains, uh, maintain it at a good moisture so that they, it doesn't turn black or moldy or red or right. mold, and also have the standards that the global market can uh, accept either as grain, like a World Food Program is best attuned to that, or as processed uh, value added into the, the food, uh, the animal feeds, uh, value chain, but also into other uh, emerging aspects of, uh, of biofuel and things like that. So basically saying we have a good catchment area, we have a good list of products, we only we, we probably need to work by adding value to those. We have a good starting point. Professor Osman, would you like to say something about it? I, I think that you face a major challenge. Uh, you, in looking at Uganda's numbers, I find that you have the lowest ur urbanization rate in the world. And you have the fastest rate of population growth in the world. So you're going to have the fastest growing uh, uh, labor force in the world. And you already have many, many people in rural areas. You, uh, po population is now over 30 million. There's, 34 million. There's, there's uh, five persons for every hectare are Arab, of arable land living in rural areas. So I don't think that the future, in, in the future you will get the new jobs in agriculture. I think, unfortunately or, or fortunately, you will need to invent a set of new activities in urban areas that can use much of the increasing uh, supply of labor that you will have. So let me tell you a few of the things that I see elsewhere. Well, you've, you have already in, 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 in Uganda is something that showed up in Kenya big time, which is flowers. Cut flowers are a big business. They are exporting something like $2 billion in cut flowers in Kenya. Um, that's one example that's sort of like nearby, but they're getting into business process outsourcing, call centers, and so on. I think that everybody has to get eventually into some kind of manufacturing. I, uh, people typically start manufacturing with garments. Uh, and from garments, they typically move to textiles and to toys, and then to electronics, and so on. So there's a, a whole set is cement construction. So maybe you know you're far from the coast and the roads are not too good, but you, that's a problem for all other producers that want to sell in the DRC or want to sell in South Sudan or want to sell in in, in Rwanda. So you know cement, uh, 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 rebars, um, uh, plastic products. Uh, and so on. There's plenty of activities there. Uh, so I, I think that you cannot uh, think uh, gradually only from the things you are currently doing in agriculture because uh, you already have one of the densest agricultural um, areas you have and, and population growth is just too, too high uh, for, for you to find a solution to your employment problems in agriculture. So I would encourage you to think more broadly in terms terms of where you where to find new opportunities. All right, so two points that stick out from what you just said. We need to cut our population growth one, two we need to focus on urbanization. Yes, well, I think that, that, that that's going to happen, and you might encourage uh, that it happen faster. I would encourage a lot population growth, a slow population growth. Yes, and, and that typically goes by I increasing the opportunities of women, expanding the, uh, the years of schooling in which uh, women stay uh, in, in school, uh, and the more they stay in school, uh, the more opportunities in the labor market they have, but there has to be some kind of a labor market because uh, in, if, if you're living in, in, in uh, rural areas, there's very little you can work in except the land around your house, and there isn't that 
that many. There's five persons per hectare already. So that's why urbanization comes in. And urbanization allows you to have much more activity and less, less, and less space. Yes. And people that have different skills are able to collaborate because they live closer together and more complex things can be done in urban areas because there's, there's more variety of skills around that can be mobilized to make things. So that's why all countries that have grown, and especially countries that have grown quickly, have urbanized. And urbanization is something that can happen in a messy way with shanty towns, with increased crime, with increased congestion and so on, or it can happen in a good way where you you plan the expansion of the city, you plan the, the spaces for production to take place. And here is where I see that, you know, there's a lot to learn from the way uh, the, uh, China has done it and the East Asians have done it. They have really transformed uh, their populations, where they live, how they live, uh, uh, and at the same time created uh, the opportunities for more productive jobs and for, for, for jobs both in services and in, in manufacturing. And I, I think that uh, Uganda is not going to be able to reach middle income levels unless it moves in that direction. Right. I mean, obviously, in China, it's one of they have the, the, one of the largest uh, proponents of, of construction. I was reading somewhere. Mm -hmm. it's the equivalent of Rome is built in China every six months. They've invested heavily in construction and urbanization, building you know apartment blocks for people to live in and cities. Yeah. Some of them are still good cities, but and they're moving somewhere. There is planned. And they have even been building industrial zones in Africa, so I wouldn't mind uh, to see an industrial zone built by the Chinese in, in Uganda. I think that uh, if, I mean, if you, it's critical that we invest in the infrastructure and the roads and the power and uh, 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 to, to power uh, more activity and in, in, in finding some places in, in, in Uganda where, where you can make sure that all the, all the, all the things are there so that uh, manufacturing uh, or business services can be done productively and that will trigger a whole set of new opportunities that are currently not here but that could be here. Mr. Moses Ogual, what do you pick from the private sector side? What do you pick? What lessons, what things can we do to trigger off development? Forget about what we're doing, get to the next level. Yeah, I don't know, I, I, I seem to get stuck how possibly we have been thinking maybe it was thinking wrongly, but uh, I think uh, the issue of doing what you're doing very well is key. Whatever you start with, I think you must do it very well. Doing, doing it very well means you need to do it more efficiently and it should bring you better results all the times. And uh, doing it very well possibly would stimulate you to move to another area. And uh, to me, I think, uh, I, I don't condemn agriculture so much because the structure we have, we maybe have to do it very well. Then possibly we are getting streams into the service areas, which possibly as a beginning, servicing industry, servicing agricultural areas or agricultural sector with its tenant, other industries will come in and uh, hopefully expand that. But one thing I think I need to say is the element of research. Research becomes very critical. Research as a service, but research as a profitable service also becomes a very uh, critical area. Not research, uh, research only as service provision, possibly by government, but research where you, you make money out of research. It makes it uh, possible the products and so on, which result from that becomes a little bit more expensive if you put more energy into those uh, areas. But the lesson I learned is do something, do it. High level of efficiency. I mean, I was reading one of the documents, and you say efficiency is for the poor countries. There you, you had innovation, you had efficiency, and the third component that keeps my mind. Efficiency is really at the bottom. Innovation is like at the top. That's where the, where the Western world is. North American, the developing world have, have leveraged their competencies. Innovation. I think we have to be careful of what we mean by innovation. 95% or 98% of innovation is just imitation. 
Okay, the problem in Uganda is not that Uganda needs to invent things that don't exist in the world. The problem in Uganda is that the world has invented already many, many things that Uganda doesn't know how to make. So what needs to happen is a process of quote-unquote innovation that means that you can sort of reverse engineer, learn how to make the things that the world already knows. There are plenty of things out there that the world already knows, buys, needs, but they are not being made in Uganda. So innovation is, is, is that. It's not inventing new products. It's just developing your capacity to make in Uganda things the world already knows. Uh, let me uh, react for a second to this issue of agriculture. I think that everything that has to be done has to be done better, can be done better, and I think that countries don't stop doing the things they do. They add more things to the things they do. So I don't want to say anything against agriculture. There will be an agricultural future in Uganda. It has, it has very fertile land and so on. But, but, if you are going to increase the efficiency of agriculture, that is going to free up labor. There's going to be fewer people em employed in, in agriculture. France is a powerhouse in agriculture. The US is a powerhouse in agriculture. Um, Australia and New Zealand are powerhouses in agriculture. Each one of them employs less than 2% of the labor force in agriculture. Yes. You employ more than 50% of the 60 per 60 80 per 80% of the labor force in agriculture. You don't need that many people right. to extract all the value you can extract from the city and if they if they want to work you have to create other opportunities for them to express their willingness to work in things that can create value and create wealth and income this is what I'm already on we're going for a break we'll be back to stay tuned discover the new invigorating taste of red vodka lemon red vodka lemon reinvent the night not for sale to persons under 80. Welcome to the MTN Service Centre, sir. Hey. How can I help you? Uh, we are here to buy MTN SIM cards. Okay. Meet my wife and my daughter and my son. This is my father. Uh, my mother and my cousin, uh, Sir. Oh, wow. That's great. Hey. I need people for my aunt, please. Hey, c c come close, aunt, please. Uh, behind here is my mechanic and my newspaper vendor and my boss and the pastor. Okay, sir. <laughs> <laughs> this Christmas, buy an MTN SIM card to win free airtime for a year. Dial star. 188 hash to win. 250 winners will immediately be notified on SMS each day. Win free airtime for a year with MTN this Christmas. Terms and conditions apply. And of course, there is my brother, uh, my Christian, my Bramba, and my Baba's best friend's girlfriend. MTN. Everywhere you go. Uh, excuse me, guys. Let me through, please. Chick, chick, this guy. Goodness, dude, what are you doing? Get real. Just, just, move. just what? A little bit, man. What, what are you doing? Bring a cow into the sitting room. It's just for when I want milk. Just what? Just please move. Just let it come and sit here. Show you this guy. You cannot keep a cow in your home, but you can get the freshness of its milk straight from the farm into your home. Get fresh diary milk. For freshness straight from the farm every day. Fresh diary. So fresh. Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90. Welcome back on Spectrum tonight. How can Uganda improve its competitiveness to attract investments? Our guest tonight, Professor Ricardo Hosman, all the way from the United States. Of uh, He's a director and professor of the practice of development, e economic development at Harvard University, one of the world's top ten universities. Dr. Peter Ngatig is a national coordinator of the competitiveness and investment secretariat at the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. And Mr. Moses Ogwal uh, Goli, director of policy and advocacy at the Private Sector Foundation. You will be able to call in and contribute to this discussion. Professor Hosman, there was, uh, very briefly before we talk about import substitution and other things, corruption and governance, is it important in developing an economy? Is corruption a good thing or is it a bad thing? And what does it do if it's a bad thing? I have never heard anybody say that corruption is a good thing. Uh, corruption is always a bad thing. Um, what we need about a government is a government that is responsive, a government that knows where the shoe hurts, a government that knows what the problems are and is able to find solutions and implement them. 
Uh, in that process, a government needs to be able to interact with society, so that society tells them what are all the things that that needs fixing, and needs to have the wherewithal internally to respond. So it has to engage with society. It has to engage with the private sector. It has to engage with with uh, peasants, and it has to engage with society to find out where the problems are, what needs fixing, and to fix it. Uh, so a government that does not interact with people uh, is is a problem. Now, in its interaction, it has to be legitimate. It has, cannot use that interaction as a way of getting money out of people or, or wasting money, right? And part of the thing that you have in Uganda is that in, uh, Uganda has been very aid dependent. It has been receiving a significant chunk of its budget and so on uh, through aid. And uh, one way for people to make money is not necessarily to engage in production, but to become attractive to aid donors. And you get the money through aid, because most people, in order to make money, they have to sell things, right? But if, if, if they're giving money away, then a lot of people start getting close to government to see if they can put their hands on, on the money. So part of the problem of corruption is also the source of, of wealth. If, if, if the money is in the government, you want, uh, you want a piece of the action. You're saying it's easier to steal dollar money. Right. <laughs> We're going to have to think about that a little bit deeper. Donors have been cutting aid. and uh, Let's talk about well, something else. Well, that's a whole day's discussion. Let's talk about something else. There is this old argument that, you know, export, promotion, import, substitution were no longer drivers of economic growth. Was that a truism? Was it a fallacy? And what are the realities right now? I think export promotion is, is, is ex exports are critical to the growth process because uh, once you figure out how to do something, it's, uh, you can sell it to 7 billion people instead of selling it to 34 million people. So it, it opens up for opportunities for growth and expansion that you wouldn't otherwise have. If you're only focused on your local market, uh, once you know how to do something, you cannot grow because the local market is too small. So exports are definitely part of the story. Import substitution sometimes happens naturally because you were importing things you don't know how to do the moment you you know how to do them and you can sell them people say I'd rather buy them locally than import them uh, now many countries in Africa and elsewhere uh, have been trying to ex exaggerate this process by putting barriers to import so that people are sort of like forced to buy domestically I think that that uh, that strategy has backfired in many places and it's not a strategy that is important for Uganda because after all it's very difficult to import things into Uganda because the road to Mombasa is very bad crossing the border is very difficult the port of Mombasa is not that efficient so you already have a lot of protections in, in the geography you don't necessarily need more I don't think that the reason why uh, you need to import so many things that you don't know how to do is because uh, it has been too easy to import I think the problem has been that uh, the capabilities that are required to make those things in Uganda have not been there and 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 so you should put the accent on uh, on developing those capabilities uh, rather than on creating obstacles to the imports Mr. Ogwal, talk to us about uh, <coughs> employment. I'll, I'll throw this back to Professor later. In your own assessment, is employment creation an important ingredient of growth? Is, should it be a critical target as you plan for your growth? Or can you grow without jobs and is, would it be a good thing? I mean, I'm talking about oil really as one of the other factors. Oil is not, does, is not a big time employer. Mining is. Is it, is it a critical target for as a, you know, an ingredient of growth? I certainly agree with, with you that uh, employment is a uh, big ingredient of growth. But I would start from <coughs> creation of wealth is actually the engine, if you want. Of but you could create wealth for the state, but you could also create wealth for the individual. I'm talking particularly where I come from, from the private sector. If you create wealth, it means you are able to employ people either directly in your farms or you are able to employ them through the supply chains which you establish. More importantly, you are able to uh, create the taxes which is very key in creating the employment process. So the genesis for it to me is the avenue to allow the private sector be able to effectively create wealth. That's where, where I start. 
Dr. Ngategize, let's talk about aid being stolen. Is that something you agree with? You're not comfortable talking about it? Well, uh, Edmund, yes, you know, those are challenges that the government is uh, uh, grappling with, uh, given the recent events. And uh, possibly that's a process that um, uh, is possibly also going to provide lessons uh, to, to talk about. You have heard in newspapers uh, where some of our leaders basically have said it's uh, good timing to be able to reflect on how efficiently we are using our resources. It's also good to think through by development partners about budget support vis-a-vis -vis, uh, project support and the right mix uh, around that, but also about uh, how to track and improve the efficiency of government uh, processes and skilling also of the public <coughs> sector in the aspects uh, of being able to efficiently manage the resources, not only for donor resources, but also um, uh, locally generated. Right. Right. Locally generated right. Professor Hosman, employment creation, is it a critical factor? Also, talk to us about equity and wealth distribution. Does it matter if the wealth is going to a few individuals? Does it have an impact on stability? Is it important to look at critically? Uh, definitely. I mean, um, I, the way I think of, of wealth creation is that I think that uh, wealth is created through work. And the entrepreneurs are the ones that organize the work, that bring the different talents together and find products that can be made um, profitably with, uh, with the teams that they're able to put together. So I would put that work is the source of, of uh, creation of wealth, and entrepreneurs are the, the, the orchestra directors. They are the conductors of the process. They are the ones that find what is the right music to play and what is the right musician to uh, to play it with and so in, in the fact that you have people willing to work that's your major source of wealth and what you need to find is new songs and and musicians that play different instruments so that your music can be uh, uh, nicer and 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 played with uh, with uh, different sounds and uh, equity this year. Well, let's talk about uh, the uh, why are some countries rich and some countries poor and I'm looking at countries that were well, 30 years ago this is a song that has become common we are the same level as the so-called Asian Tigers now they are far ahead of us closer to home at, uh, they used to be drawing, drawing parallels between Uganda and Ghana Ghana was able to sell oil in three and a half years of course they are closer to the sea Uganda cannot sell oil it will take us probably 12 years you know looking going forward what makes one country better off and another not I think I I, I think that Uganda has uh, outperformed Ghana so uh, in, in, in many dimensions so I would compare myself to Thailand. Thailand uh, 25 years ago uh, was an exporter of rice, of uh, sugar, uh, of, uh, of rubber, uh, uh, and of um, maize. And today 50% of Thai Thailand's exports are machinery, cars, and electronics. Uh, and exports have increased by a factor of 20 or so. Uh, they have completely transformed what they do. They still export rice, they still export sugar, they still export rubber in greater quantities. So agriculture has not declined. But other things have exploded. And they have done that not because they have trained people in learning English as, uh, as the lingua franca. They, they haven't done that. You have done that and you're in the process of doing that, that's a good thing. They have done it by sorting out, attracting investors, in their case Japanese investors, uh, to, to establish themselves around Bangkok and to create the right infrastructure for them to be able to operate efficiently, tax them so that they can contribute to, uh, to the expansion of the infrastructure and the schooling and the training of workers, right? And, uh, and, and make production, in, make economic activity productive so that these these guys can grow and bring in more of their friends into the country. So that that to me is, is the story. The story, the countries are rich 
because they know how to make more things and more complex things. And countries grow because they expand into more things and into more complex things. And, and that is exactly what happened in East Asia. They did not abandon agriculture, but they added a bunch of things that were not there. And they added them by, by bringing in know-how that was not there before more complex things from pineapples to other things right and even you know exporting fresh pineapples is a very sophisticated things I think it requires a cold storage transport system it requires a uh, phytosanitary pyramids it requires um, uh, food safety standards to be certified it requires a, you know the control of pests and so on and and the right production so that there are any chemicals or wrong things in the process <coughs> that is high-tech that's high tech. It requires, high tech. Uh, it, it requires a logistic system where, where you can sell that fresh pineapple in London before it rots. It requires a lot of stuff. But once you have sor sorted out all those problems, you can f uh, sell fresh herbs or you can sell fresh produce of many different kinds. But you know, where is the value chain? You have the airports, you have the um, cold storage, you have the cold storage, you have the, all the certifiers, you have a whole, a whole creation of value in a bunch of non agricultural activities that are the things that permit a fresh pineapple to be eaten in Europe made in Uganda. Basically, you create a multi purpose pipeline. A multi purpose pipeline, and once that multi-purpose pipeline is there, you're, you are going to find that, that your purposes change. Uh, you know, when, when Colombia developed um, the cold chain to be able to export their flowers, a bunch of other producers found that they could use that same chain to export a bunch of other products. Uh, Chile is a, is a very similar story. Chile has the same uh, uh, agricultural produce as California because they are at the same latitude, but they, they, the crops come up at the opposite end of the year. So they have the whole U.S. market open when they have no competition in the north. But they had to build this whole logistics system, this whole network, to be able to do that. That is high tech. That is not low tech. Very briefly before we hear from the listeners, and I'd like you to talk to us about policies. What kind of policies do you think we need to trigger, to, to, to touch to? Briefly, what, how should we manage our oil? Oil is supposed to begin flowing in about three, four years' time. Should we trust it to individuals or to institutions? Which one works better normally? Very briefly. Look, from what I know about Ugandan oil, there isn't that much that you have found. Uh, uh, and, and you haven't found enough to suppose that it's going to be with you for too many decades. Uh, to put it to you in some numbers, you have found something that at its peak would be, in per capita terms, one-fifth of what it is in Nigeria. It's one-twentieth of what it is in my country, Venezuela. It's one-seventieth of what it is in, 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 um, in, Saudi Arabia. in Saudi Arabia. And it's something like one-two-hundredth of what it is in Norway. So, so don't think that you have found something that now you can live off of that and not do other things. Okay? It's a small thing. It's going to be very helpful. I think that you have to use it in something that will stay with you. So, for example, if you transform the infrastructure of the country, if you transform the power system of the country, if you transform the road system of the country, if you transform the educational system of the country, those things will stay with you once the oil is gone. Right. But if you just consume it, uh, you will, uh, the next generation will blame you for it. Well, it's, uh, let's hear from the, of course, when I say these things, when I say oil is not such a big deal, they think I don't love my country. It's just <laughs> as well that you say from where we're coming. Let's hear from you. Listeners are Numbers on Spectrum tonight: zero four one four three four eight one 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 zero one two two six zero three nine zero zero three one two two six one three nine zero. Yes, Max. You said the development of the new to simplify his work. I will be enthusiastic when I hear. We are leaders. He keeps talking about how is it easy for the African interviewers to access factors of production. And that's why our elder brother, in these things, one of you in Singapore, talks about very free industry zones. Seems like easy access of loans to the producer. When we meet these challenges, I believe this will be done with development. Good brother. Spot on there. Spectrum alert. Okay, let's get back to. Okay, we have another color. Spectrum alert. 
Good evening, your name. Thank you so much for this very informative discussion. I agree with the professor. Your name, sir? Then Mujimba calling from the village. Now, I really agree with the professor about how we should be doing our own reform. I think our members of parliament, instead of declaring over, you know, who should approve, who should revoke licenses, they should invest more time in actually discussing how should the future generation benefit from this oil reform. You know, infrastructure, energy, education, because we can have a complete advantage by having a very strong human resource that is well educated in keeping all these industries in the country. We have people who can be employable there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Majimba. Let's get back to the studio. Professor Hosman. So the first call you made a very good point. In I think entrepreneurs in Singapore have it easy vis-a-vis -vis entrepreneurs in Uganda. Entrepreneurs, you know, fish don't know they are in water. They take water for granted. You know, you have to bring a fish out of water to understand that he's in water, right? So, you know, when a, an entrepreneur in Singapore thinks about doing business, he doesn't think about, you know, power as a problem. He just, you know, makes a phone call and power appears. He doesn't think about skills as a problem. He just puts a small announcement in the newspaper and people come. He doesn't think about going through customs or ports or, or logistics as a problem. You know, all these problems are solved. So his time is spent in, you know, in, in other things, in things about the, the quality of the product, the quality of the, uh, uh, the design of the product, the marketing of the things. So he, uh, he spends his time in in things that add value, while an entrepreneur in, in Uganda has to uh, spend much of his time in, in, in compensating for the fact that an ecosystem that supports his activities is not yet fully developed. Mr. Ogwal, could you talk to us about some of the policy changes we will need, policy uh, shifts that we will need to allow these kind of things to flow? I think the quick one is a quick ask. Ask the entrepreneurs the question. How, what should we do to enable Ukraine to well, better? That is the simple question. You will ask us to credit. Yeah, I mean, those are the simple Infrastructure. questions which should be asked. And the government needs to respond to that. Ask the question, how can you create more wealth as an interpreter? He will tell you exactly what you have been hearing. And the ABC of it starts from infrastructure, skills, Regulatory related issues and encumbrances, credits, then them. Those are clear issues which come out. And in Uganda, we have attempted to do that with some great success, and that requires a lot of improvement. <coughs> Dr. Ngatagize, what kind of policies do you think we need to, you know, streamline? Structure? Well, just uh, building up on what uh, Ogwar has just said. I think clearly this government over the last few years um, has attempted in practical terms to respond to those questions that interpreters or the responses would be giving to the question. I think we are all aware on the extent to which the budget uh, has increasingly uh, got more allocations to infrastructure. And more recently, you are aware of the launch of the uh, Kampala Interior Superhighway and uh, Kampala Jinja is coming on board soon. Uh, the hydropower, Bujagari and uh, Karuma is in the process. That's on the infrastructure briefly. Secondly, as he mentioned about regulatory issues, if you use uh, the doing business report, the most recent one, you find one of our best scores is around getting credit at 40 out of 185 uh, economies. Basically, as a result of the introduction of the financial card, ability to capture data on people who are interfacing with commercial banks, so that then one is able to incentivize those who pay and penalize those who don't. Secondly, in the most last past uh, budget speech, 
the Minister of Finance uh, extensively talked about how we have an initiative, a process, comprehensive process of reviewing the business licenses in this country. And recommendations were announced, and we announced the process of implementation. Finally, I can say on uh, industry-related uh, aspects, there are initiatives of addressing these areas. The Free Zones Bill has already moved beyond the um, uh, Cabinet, and we are looking into increasing resources into um, these aspects that I may call incubation facilities, or if you want to call them, uh, I think by means of finance, basically call them workspaces or industrial parks that we are talking to. So government with the resources we have um, uh, is increasingly uh, shifting to addressing these challenges. And as you are aware, Edmund, um, there are fora that allow for government engagement with the private sector uh, to be able to capture uh, these uh, demands that the private sector would like to see in place. <coughs> All right, now, Professor Hosbert, probably as we get to the end of this discussion, uh, what, uh, what, 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 who are the major change agents if we have to, imp if we have to uh, you know, implement some of the recommendations that you're putting forward? Is it the private sector, civil society? Who are the major change agents, government? Look, um, I think that um, there is uh, the private sector on its own cannot do the job. The government on its own cannot do the job. Civil society on its own cannot do the job. Uh, successful countries are countries where these three groups are able to collaborate, identify problems, identify opportunities, find solutions, implement, uh, and, and move on. Uh, it's an ability of society as a whole to have a purpose, to have a goal, to have a, a vision of its own future, and, and to develop trust between the different members, to develop a communication channels between the different members, and to open up opportunities. And the last thing I want to say is, look, the average age, average age of people in Uganda is 15 years. That's very young. Okay? You need to make sure that those 16, 18-year-old kids, they think that they are going to build the firms of tomorrow. They are going to create the companies that will get the jobs for the people of tomorrow. They are the ones who have to be imagining the future. They are the ones who are going to be writing applications for the iPhone. They are the ones who are going to be building the, 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 the call centers of tomorrow. They are the ones that have to imagine the future of Uganda. They, they, they are the ones that are going to build Uganda going forward. And you, you need to invest in their imagination. You need to make them believe that their dreams can come true. And that if they really dream, the rest of society, government, the private sector, the NGOs, and so on, are going to be there to lend a hand so that they can achieve their dreams because their dreams are Uganda's dreams. Very interesting. I met a young man earlier today and I asked him, what do you want to do 15 years from now? And then he began to think, maybe just before we go, again, employment creation, how vital is it to growth? I think uh, I'm trying to point at jobless growth. Is it a good thing or is it not? I, I mean, I think that good growth is a growth that uses people's willingness to work to create value. And everybody who's willing to work is a source of value. And every person who doesn't have a job and is willing to work is a waste. It's an economic waste. It's an inefficiency. We have to go. Thank you very much. It's so much to talk about. We couldn't really cover it in one discussion tonight. But I must thank you very much. It's Professor Ricardo Hosman, all the way from Harvard University in the United States. States of America. He's the director for the Center for International Development and uh, professor of the practice of economic development at Harvard. Thank you very much for coming to Spectrum tonight, sir. Thank you. Dr. Peter Ngategizi, national coordinator of the Competitiveness and Investment Secretary in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. Thank you for coming to Spectrum tonight. Mr. Moses Ogwal, Mr. Moses Ogwal Goli, director of policy and advocacy at the Private Sector Foundation. Thank you, Thank you for tuning in. I've been your host, Edmond Chisto. Spectrum will be back tomorrow. Up next is the news in English. <laughs> my greatest music hit of all time hmm. The first time I heard the electric guitar On my father's record player I'll never forget Seeing the money with my eye But for me It's when Sony's first hit the airways It's our time to make history Witness the rise of Africa's music talent At the Tuscan World 100 Club For more information Visit www.
www.tmo100.com today. Tuscamore.